Good morning to all of you. I warmly welcome everyone for today's CPD program organized by Government Medical Officers Association and Society for Health Research and Innovation. The webinar link will be open to you until 10 a.m. and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should attend till the end of the webinar to obtain e-certificate for participation. You will be given CPD points, which are strictly adhered to NCCPD guidelines. But apart from CPD points, you will be given the e-certificate for participation. The link for applying certificate will be sent to the chat box at the end of the webinar. The chat box will be open to you for your queries and they will be discussed at the end of session. Also, we kindly ask you to mute your microphones and switch off videos to avoid any interruption during the session. So now let me introduce to Dr. Himal Osana Kanabarakchi, Acting Consultant Physician to introduce today's speaker. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Maliki. I hope you can hear me. Right, Maliki, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, can you hear me, people? Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, GMO Street webinar series. Uh, this is a collaborative effect with uh, Sri Lankan College of Internal Medicine and Sri. Today our topic is management of acute poisoning, what we should do and do. Today our research person is Dr. Nidosha Madhuan Kithiyarachi, MBBS MD, FCCC, FACP, and FRCP. She's a specialist physician in internal medicine, currently working in a toxicology unit teaching muscle Pera Devi. Dr. Madhuanti Hithiyar is a full-time clinician and trainer and researcher. Her main interests are uh, NCDs, tropical infectious disease, and toxicology and snake bites. She has authored uh, and presented more than 50 research articles in uh, international and local forums. She's uh, one of the lead author of uh, high definition guideline author of Diabetes Guideline Ministry of Health. And she's a member of uh, Board of Study Toxicology and Tutor in MSc Toxicology Program in Sri Lanka. And she's an uh, examining of four undergraduate and postgraduate students, including MD Emergency Medicine, MD Medicine and Pediatrics Physical Care, and MSc Toxicology. And she's a uh, uh, council member of Sri Lankan Medicine of Indo Sri Lankan College of Internal Medicine. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Nirosha Madhuan to start her lecture. Madam, session is over to you now. Thank you. Good morning to you all. I hope you all can hear me. Yes, Madam, we can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for those kind words of introduction, Himal. Uh, today, my topic is acute management of poisons, do's and don'ts. Actually, suicide mortality rate is very high in Sri Lanka. Um, it's 14 point per 100,000 according to the uh, 2015 uh, Sri Lankan Police Report. And it's a major health burden in most countries, including uh, Sri Lanka. And it's uh, common, very common in the young, and we have noted that many deaths occur due to late presentation and unidentified poisons. So the poisoning tendency has actually shifted from agrochemicals to the pharmacological substances uh, of late. Still, uh, pesticide poisoning is one of the most common uh, uh, admissions uh, to uh, our ETUs in Sri Lanka. In uh, Sri Lanka, providing a specific antidote for a poison drug and a drug is a challenge due to its high cost. And we have to remember supportive measures and low cost antidotes reduce the case fatality rates. Now, uh, let's uh, have a quick look at my roadmap. Now, I will first discuss uh, an approach to unconscious patient with possible poisoning and do's and don'ts of decontamination procedure, management of OP poisoning, paracetamol poisoning, and a little bit about the common plant poisoning also. So let's move on to our case scenario. There's a 45 year old farmer who has admitted uh, to your unit and you're the medical officer in the ward and he's found unconscious in the paddy field, which has happened one hour back. And uh, he's on treatment for a psychiatric illness, but the relatives are unaware about the medication. So when you approach this patient 
as you all aware, you have to apply the ABCD approach and you have to check the airways and breathing and circulation and uh, disability and see whether there is any evidence of exposure. So I'm not going to go into details about the ABCD approach. So let us see what ABCD is in this patient. ARV is actually not patent. There were a lot of secretion with a saturation of 91% on root mare and the respiratory rate is 10 per minute. And of examination of the lungs revealed wheezing and bilateral crepitation. When you look at the pulse, it was 50 per minute with a blood pressure of 80 by 60, which is actually um, uh, reduced. And the uh, GCS is 5 over 15. The pupils are one millimeter in size bilaterally and the CBS is 150 milligrams a deciliter. Now he's sweating profusely, or lower limb reflexes are normal. And uh, it was difficult to uh, elicit any other neurological signs because his GCS was low. And uh, no obvious bite marks are there and no bleeding or rashes. Now, how are you going to approach this patient? So what is the next step? Uh, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it a pontine hemorrhage? Can it be lithium overdose? Can it be OP ingestion, straight bite, or post thicker stage of epilepsy? Let's analyze our diagnosis. Pontine hemorrhage, um, you can explain the small pupils and depressed res respiration, but the other things you won't be able to explain with a pontine hemorrhage. Lithium overdose, you can explain the bradycardia and hypertension, but the other problems will not be easy to explain. And um, the Organophosphate ingestion, yes, there are you know, features suggestive of uh, OP poison. There are small pupils, he's have bradycardia, hypotensive, he's having crackles and wheezes in the lungs with depressed respiration and excessive sweating. Uh, what about great bite? Mm, you can explain the respiratory depression, but all the other things you might not be able to. And the post dictal stage of epilepsy, you can explain the crackles in a case of aspiration. So in, in this scenario, uh, the, the most possible diagnosis is uh, organophosphate poison. Now, when you're taking a history in a case of a poison, it's very important to take a collateral uh, history from the relatives of the patients or who are, uh, who are within his uh, premises or who was with the patient uh, when he was seen last. So ask what they have seen. They, whether they have patient the, uh, seen the patient last, um, when uh, they have seen the patient last to guess a uh, little time, you know, guess the timing of the poison intake and ask for any remaining tablets, any beast packs available, any poisons or labels, uh, remaining of poison. Ask for any clinic note of patients or of relatives who is living with the patient and get the labels, as I said, uh, if any poisons are, uh, any poisonous uh, substances around surrounding uh, area, if it, there's a bottle, you need to bring in the bottle as well as the label. And remember, when you're transferring this patient to the tertiary care uh, hospital, especially when you're in a periphery, make sure you, are, you get these labels and send with the patient uh, because it's important for us to uh, uh, for, uh, plan the further management. So ask whether the patient has vomited at home and uh, whether uh, the, what is the color and whether they, uh, they have seen any contents of the vomitus, any particles of tablets or anything like that. And time lapse of the patient to reach the hospital is also very important as well as what was done at the peripheral hospital if he was transferred from another hospital. So these things uh, are really important when you take a history. And it's important for you to write all these things down in the transfer form also. So how are you going to uh, ad uh, admit this patient? Um, I mean, uh, approach this patient once the patient was suspected to be a, a poisonous case. Now, um, within one hour of the inc uh, incidence, uh, once you have st stabilized the patient after resuscitation, you can uh, do the gastric decontamination if indicated. Uh, the, when the, if the poison is swallowed, you can give a sip of water to wash the uh, mouth. Uh, and then if the poison is inhaled, you get immediately uh, the patient out of uh, the, that uh, particular uh, place and get some pressure and uh, ask him not to breathe. And uh, uh, if the poison has entered the eyes, maybe you can flood the eyes with saline or cold water. Uh, according to the uh, indications. Now, if the skin is contaminated, it, contaminated, you might have to remove the clothing. 
Uh, now, the next step is whether we are going to give the gastric lavage um, or activated charcoal. So these things can uh, be determined uh, according to the uh, time limit and according to indications and contraindications, which I'm going to uh, sort of, you know, talk you through a little later. Uh, now, why, what not to do in a patient with poisoning? Now, I have seen several patients coming into our unit from peripheries. They have induced vomiting don't induce vomiting. It will do harm to the patient, especially uh, if the patient uh, is aspirated, then uh, we might be able to make him uh, survive uh, according to the, I mean, um, with, with the poisonous substance, but might not be able to um, make him survive uh, due to, you know, aspiration pneumonia. And sometimes the, the, when the activated charcoal is aspirated, it's very difficult and it, that can lead to uh, fibrosis of the lung. So, don't induce vomiting, okay? And when, uh, when is gastric lavage not indicated? When uh, more than two hours have passed since poisoning, but except in some cases, which I will highlight a little later. So you, you, you can consider it. the first hour is the most crucial. You can do it within the first hour if, it is, if there are no contraindications, but the uh, two hour period you can consider and even four hour period you can consider if the patient has taken extended release of tablets and large amount of uh, a poison. So those things are possible uh, if, if the gastric lavage is indicated in such circumstances. Um, so con uh, gastric lavage is contraindicated if the patient is very uncooperative when struggling and there's a high risk of aspiration and patients who have taken strong caustics, as you all know, uh, corrosives or volatile hydrocarbon poisons such as kerosene or tempered time. Now, in these circumstances, you now if, if you think that the patient is having high risk of aspiration because the GCS is low, you need to first uh, do a uh, intubation, cough intubation, and then try the gastric lavage through a NG tube. So, as I said, if the patient is coming within first one to two hours, according to the national guidelines, you can do the gastric lavage. Patient has to be fully conscious. Uh, so, as I said earlier, you need to do, put a cuffed ET tube if the patient is not fully conscious. If the GC is less than 10, you need to intubate if, if it's a uh, patient coming with poisoning. So how are you going to do the gastric lavage? You need to first get the informed consent from the patient or from a relative. If the patient is drowsy, protect the airways in recovery position, and you need to in, in a, put a cuff DT tube and AT engage NG tube or rias tube orally after measuring the distance uh, from, uh, uh, from the nose to the stomach and using a mouth gag to prevent patient from biting the tube. And then once you confirm the correct placement of the tube in the stomach by aspirating some fluid out, of, out or injecting some uh, air uh, in, into a 50 ml syringe uh, while auscultating over the epigastrium, you can uh, siphon off the gastric contents before lavage. This, so this is very important. Even if you're in a periphery, please take the first uh, 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 50 ml of lavage fluid for toxicological analysis. And please be kind enough to send it to the peripheral uh, transfer uh, ring center as well. It's important to take a, uh, I have to tell you this uh, at this moment, when you're taking the blood also, you need to take a 10 ml of uh, blood and keep it uh, for further uh, toxicological evaluation and medical legal purposes. If it, uh, if there's a, uh, you know, a homicidal uh, um, case, if it is a homicidal case and uh, you need to involve the medical legal uh, personnel, then uh, they will ask for it, okay? So make sure that you do both things. And a small amount of lavage fluid should be repeatedly introduced. And the recommended volume of each aliquot is 200 ml for adults and 10 ml for kg for children. Now, when are you going to stop giving lavage? When a total of three liter of lavage fluid is used and the return is clear. So that is when you stop it. Uh, all right, now let's move on uh, to uh, activated charcoal. Uh, so within two hours of admission, it is indicated. Uh, the up to four hours if, if there's a large poison uh, and in uh, slow release medications also you might have to give multiple doses of activated charcoal as well as yellow oleander uh, 
uh, and sometimes in Niagala poisoning also. So this is actually drinking is much, much more comfortable for the patient than giving it via an NG. But if the patient is, of, of course, not conscious, you might have to give it via the NG. Dose is one gram per kg. You need to dissolve it uh, in 200 ml of water, uh, 50 grams, and get the patient to drink. Uh, so if the patient is unconscious, again, secure airway with a cup TT tube, and then you can give it via the NG. If multiple doses are given, you need to give it 50 gram every four hours or 24 hours. Now, what are the important investigations that you will need to do in every person patient? Artery blood gas analysis is of utmost importance because you can uh, uh, get so much of information by doing a blood gas, acid-based status of the patient, electrolyte levels, uh, whether the patient is hypoglycemic or not, what's the bicarbonate status, and uh, the calcium levels, everything can be, and electrolyte levels, everything can be revealed by doing arterial blood gas. So it will be so useful for you to um, uh, manage the further events. And again, ECGs, uh, they will go into uh, electrolyte imbalances and so on, and they can uh, have uh, arrhythmia. So ECG is very important as well as an RBS and electrolytes. As I said earlier, ionized calcium and magnesium also has a place because we might have to replace these. Clear and as well as phosphate. Serum creatinine, full blood count, CPK, STOT, PT, INR, and uh, APTT will be beneficial in certain patients. And uh, grouping and DT also, if uh, you have to uh, give some uh, blood and blood products. So let's uh, go back to the history again. Now our patient is uh, 45 year old and his GCS is about five. And these are the findings in the quick assessment of this patient. Now, what is the next step in the immediate treatment? We have diagnosed as the uh, patient is having OP poisoning. So what is the next step in this patient? Immediate step. Are you going to induce vomiting? Do you do the gastric lavage or give activated charcoal, atropine IV or PAM? So what, which is which? comes first. The correct answer, shall we see? The induction of vomiting, I, as I said, never for any patient. The gastric lavage, important, but you can you have to give antidote in this case. And after intubating, you can uh, do the gastric lavage. Activated charcoal, again, the same thing, important, but you can give after the antidote and after intubation and gastric lavage. Uh, PAM, uh, you have to give only once the life-saving measures are completed again. Uh, with the atropine you can give. But first thing is to start the atropine. It's the life-saving measure to prevent cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest. Patient is having lots of secretions and uh, patient is having a bad lung. And uh, if you try to intubate at this point, you will lose the patient. So when you are uh, putting two cannulas, two white book cannulas, uh, start, uh, start normal saline and start giving atropine. So the diagnosis is OP poisoning in this patient. Uh, organophosphates and carbamates are actually they are potent, potent choline stress inhibitors and they cause severe cholinergic toxicity uh, following cutaneous exposure, inhalation or ingestion. Now there's a, a mnemonic, dumbbells and sludge for you to uh, remember the uh, uh, things which will happen in this uh, cholinergic crisis. So there can be diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bronchorrhea, bradycardia, MSIs, lacrimation, and salivation. Uh, again, sludge is also uh, a mnemonic. You can remember all these things. So what are the indications to start atropine? If the patient is having a low blood pressure, systolic blood pressure less than 80, pulse rate 80, wheezes and crackles on auscultation, small pupils, excessive sweating in the axilla. If you have uh, if you find any of these things with the suspicion of OP poisoning, you can start atropine. All right. Now uh, you might um, you might ask me, uh, what if you are not sure? You can give you know two vials. One vial is 0.6. Or you can give a trial and see whether there's a quick response to the pulse rate. And um, if it is not a OP poison, the patient will get atropinized soon, but not, uh, you know, uh, in a case with OP poisoning. So that's it. You can do it as a trial basis also. So how are we going to administer atropine in an OP poisoning? You have to give three to five vials as a bolus. Uh, one vial, as I said, is 0.6. Uh, and uh, that how, how are we going to give three to five hours? How are 
are going to determine that will depends on the clinical situation of the patient so if the patient is having you know uh, all the symptoms and signs you might and the patient has ingested a large amount of you know a poison then you can start with a higher dose say five vials all right now you need to double the vials in boluses uh, every five minutes until the patient is fully atropinized you need to assess every five minutes and if you're given earlier you know say for an example four vials the next five minutes if the patient is not fully atropinized you might have to give the double uh, the dose that means six vials all right so uh, likewise you need to uh, double the boluses every five minutes until the patient is fully atropinized so how are you going to elicit atropinization you need to have a clear chest the heart rate should be more than 80 beats per minute the pupil is no longer pinpoint and the patient is having dry axillary and the systolic blood pressure more than 80 um, and remember, tachycardia and midriasis are not contraindications to atropine use because sometimes tachycardia is again a uh, feature of um, cholinergic crisis that can happen. So uh, bear that in mind also. So it's, you need to uh, start atropine if the patient is having lots of crackers in the lungs. So, all right. And um, uh, the next step is now you have achieved the atropinization. Are you going to stop the infusion? No, you're not. You need to calculate what was given as boluses before and then start an infusion using 20% of what was given as boluses every hour. For an instance, if you are given um, 100 milligram of uh, you know, atropine, uh, one fifth of that, um, you can start with an 20 milligram, you can start as an infusion every hour. Now, you can uh, keep reducing the rate every half an hour according to the three vital parameters, life, the lungs are clear, heart rate uh, is, uh, you know, more than 80 and the blood pressure is all right, you can uh, consider reducing the rate. Um, and you need to revisit the parameters at 30 minutes for three hours, followed by hourly for six hours and three to six hourly for next 24 to 48 hours. If atropinization is lost at any point, say the, the patient has developed bronchospasms or bradycardia, then you need to give a boluses again until they are going to disappear. And uh, again, now remember to add that 20% of all the boluses that you have given to the infusion during the next hour. So that's how you will escalate the atropine infusion. Now, hundreds of milligrams may be needed over days in severe poisoning. Please remember that. While this is happening, you need to intubate the patient also, put an NG and do a gastric lavage and give activated charcoal also. So how, what are the features of atropine toxicity? Some, sometimes this can happen. Patient will have uh, hallucination, the patient will be excited, anxious, anxious, restless, and the patient will be hyperpyrexial, and there can be dry mouth, mitriasis, patient will complain of uh, blurred vision or dry skin. So atropine toxicity, hot as a hair, blind as a bed, dry as a bone, red as a beet, and mad as a hen. So that can happen when you are treating with atropine. So how are you going to manage that? You will stop atropine infusion, check again after 30 minutes to see whether the feature, features have settled. If not, continue to review every 30 minutes or so. When, do, when that do settle, you need to restart at 70 to 80% of the previous rate. And then you need to, um, uh, the patient should be seen frequently to ensure that the new infusion rate has reduced the signs of atropine toxicity and without uh, reappearance of the cholinergic signs. So it has to be a fine balance. Uh, so what is the place of FAM in OP poisoning? This is one question that you might ask. Since atropine does not uh, bind to nicotinic receptors, it is ineffective in treating neuromuscular dysfunction, muscle weakness and tremors and fasciculation. Atropine will, will only help with the muscarinic effects. Uh, PAM is recommended for the nicotinic effects. But there are certain uh, concerns also. There are some literature which uh, says PAM is not effective. So, uh, but having said that, they, uh, uh, most of the uh, guidelines do recommend giving PAM. Two grams uh, IV over 30 minutes, 25 milligram per kg in children uh, may repeat after 30 minutes or give continuous infusion if it is uh, severe. Um, Continuous infusion should be given at a 8 milligram per kg per hour in adults and 10 milligram per kg per hour in children. Uh, PAM should not be administered without concurrent atropine in order to prevent worsening symptoms due to transient oxygen induced acetyl 
choline esterase inhibition. So don't give PAM all alone. And um, uh, what to do if a, a patient develops a seizure? You need to give diazepam, 10 milligram IV, and repeat as necessary. And please do not give phenytoin. How to identify uh, intermediate syndrome in OP poisoning? It usually occurs 24 to 96 hours after the exposure. Bulbar and respiratory and proximal uh, muscle weakness are some of prominent features. And um, you might, uh, the patient uh, can die from respiratory paralysis. And uh, treatment is actually elective intubation and uh, ventilation. So usually uh, resolve within one to three weeks. How we are going to uh, uh, assess the proximal limb uh, muscle or respiratory weakness, you can ask the patient to uh, do a one breath count and uh, ask the patient to raise the head uh, uh, from the bed while you are uh, pressing the uh, forehead with your uh, hand, where you're applying pressure. All right. So that's one way of, you know, checking uh, whether the patient is going into intermediate syndrome you need to electively intubate patient rather than waiting the abg will help you to find out whether the patient is retaining carbon dioxide um what is the special thing about lipid soluble substances have you heard about propanopos might have so it's a it's actually a lipid soluble op so the lipophilic agents such as diclofentheon pentheon and malathion are associated with delayed onset of symptoms so up to five days they can give uh, problems and prolonged illness also greater than 30 days. So uh, it may be related to rapid adipose fat uptake and delayed redistribution from the fat store. So you need to uh, remember that also. Uh, let's, let's have a quick look at the antidote uh, which are available for OP, atropine and PAM, carbamates, atropine only. So paracetamol, inacetyl, cysteine, and methionine, benzodiazepine, it's the flumacenil. So the digoxin kanero antidote antibodies, but unfortunately it's not available in Sri Lanka. It's very expensive. And uh, the propanil poisoning, it's the methylene blue. Methanol and ethylene glycol poisoning. Homipisol is the drug of choice, which is not available in Sri Lanka and very expensive also. It's the uh, it's a inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase, but uh, we use alcohol as an alternative. Calcium channel blocker, calcium gluconate and higher therapy, high insulin, uh, dextrose, glycemic therapy, you need to start the patient on. And the beta blockers also glucagon and then higher therapy, uh, iron, uh, desperioxamine, and the opioids, the naloxone. So this is a little bit, um, little, uh, you know, touching only this area because uh, of the time constraints. Then let's talk about paracetamol poisoning again. Paracetamol is rapidly absorbed from the small intestine. In therapeutic doses, peak serum concentration occurs within one to two hours uh, for the standard tablet. Um, and uh, uh, toxic dose is usually be considered as 150 milligram per kilogram body weight. Now, how to decontaminate? Now, adult patients who present soon after potentially toxic ingestion, um, sing more, single dose more than or equal to 7.5, are likely to benefit from gastrointestinal decontamination. And you can give him uh, immediate release, 50 gram of activated charcoal within two hours, up to four hours if the uh, level is more than 30 grams of paracetamol. And even in some, in some countries, there are modified release preparations also, then you can give that. Uh, so as I said, uh, in, in that case, uh, the patient will be benefited from multiple doses as absorption may continue up to 24 hours. So you need to seek ex expert advice regarding that. Um, so this is how par paracetamol actually uh, works. In healthy individuals, about 95% of paracetamol is usually conjugated with gl uh, glucuronide and it's excreted in urine, as you can see, 95%. Now that remaining 5%, um, uh, will be conjugated with glutathione. This is uh, what you call NAPQ, which is the toxic metabolites that happens due to C5P450 metabolism. And this, uh, meta uh, this metabolite is actually heterotoxic. So what happens usually is with the glutathione, it uh, causes um, a conjugation and into a non-toxic compound. Um, in a large paracetamol overdose, what happens is this uh, this part will be uh, saturated, this part will be saturated and most of the, uh, the things will be uh, diverted towards C by P450 
50 metabolism pathway uh, in, uh, increase in the NAPQ concentration and the glutathione reserves are also depleted. Now, uh, NAC is actually the antidote NAC will uh, be uh, beneficial uh, in increasing the glutathione reserves. So how are you going to uh, decide when to give uh, NAC or methionine? What to do? And uh, uh, that depends on the paracetamol level. Actually, we don't have paracetamol levels, the facilities. Uh, we're in Petition Hospital Peradina, we have, uh, due to you know, some research collaborations, we do get the uh, paracetamol level, uh, level sometimes. Um, we have the ability to do it, do it but not in any, any other uh, uh, hospitals in Sri Lanka. So the uh, I, I will discuss what's the importance of Romac-Matthew nomogram. Can you see that there's uh, yeah, this line? You can see this line. So this is at, at four, four hours, you usually check the paracetamol levels. And if it is more than 150, you know the patient is in uh, paracetamol toxic levels, then you can decide on uh, the uh, treatment. Now there's a safe, this is actually a uh, high risk individuals have a uh, have other uh, low uh, line uh, if the patient is a uh, alcoholic if the patient is having uh, taking uh, enzyme inducing drugs uh, and the patient is very cachectic patient is malnourished uh, the patient is having anorexia nervosa uh, patient is having uh, alcoholic liver diseases so uh, or any other liver diseases so th this kind of patients come in uh, this range. So this is actually the safe area. Now, as I said earlier, 150 milligram per liter at four hours nomogram is currently used in the USA, Canada, and Australia and New Zealand. If the levels are available, check it after four hours and plot it on the nomogram. You can decide as per the level. If the levels are not available, you need to go by the dose and the body weight as we are doing it at the moment in Sri Lanka. So what are the antidotes? Uh, you have heard about these things, oral methionine, IVO, oral NAC. Hmm? Uh, having said that, uh, superiority of NAC over methionine is not proven in head-to-head -head large trials. There are a few studies done in Sri Lanka also, and they, are, they have actually shown that NAC is as effective as methionine. Uh, and the other thing is NAC is very expensive, and uh, you have to have a clinical decision regarding whether to give methionine or NAC in uh, these patients. If patients present within uh, eight hours, you can give methionine. Methionine is recommended for asymptomatic patients with a toxic dose. Uh, so in, if the patient is not vomiting because it's an oral medication, um, you can give methionine. If, and if the patient has come late, you know, uh, then 10 to 12 hours, you might not be able to give methionine. Um, or, or if the patient is having established liver injury also, uh, you might not be able to give methionine. So because there's a uh, uh, antidote which has actually proven. So that's the neck. Uh, so if you're giving oral methionine, adults and children weighing over 20 kg, 2.5 gram initially, followed by three more doses, 2.5 gram given forwardly. Uh, children weighing less than 20 uh, kilograms, methionine one gram orally initially, followed by three doses of one gram, uh, uh, four hourly. The total dose is four grams for them. Uh, the indications for NAC, um, uh, survival from paracetamol overdose is generally considered to be 100% in cases receiving NAC within eight hours of exposure. Actually, this is research proven. Uh, efficacy seems to be declining after this point, but still, as I said uh, late, earlier, uh, when you can't give methionine after eight hours, you can still give NAC. Uh, if the patient is found to have uh, elevated transaminases, so evidence of hepatotoxicity, uh, you need to give NAC. And um, again, IVNAC is uh, con considered if there's severe vomiting and cannot tolerate oral methionine. Uh, when you're giving antidote, uh, in most of the uh, centers in Sri Lanka, three bag method is given, uh, me method is uh, uh, done. Intravenous uh, weight based acetylcysteine, 150 milligram per kilogram body weight over 15 to 60 minutes, um, uh, actually given first. Uh, that's a bolus. Then you consider 50 milligram uh, per kg over next four hours, and then 100 milligram per kg over next 16 hours. 
it all together three times but in most of the other countries they uh, use the two bag method because they have noted when you're giving the bolus dose within uh, 15 to 60 minutes they can develop anaphylactoid reactions due to neck so to avoid that they have they are using two bag method uh, where they give uh, 200 milligram per kg in glucose or normal saline five percent dextrose or normal saline over four hours uh, then uh, consider uh, giving 100 milligram per kg uh, IV over next 16 hours. So that's the two bag method. Uh, if ongoing acetyl uh, cysteine is required, then you need to continue at the rate of 100 milligram over 16 hours. In a case where the patient has taken a huge dose, you might have to increase the rate to 200 milligram per kg for a massive paracetamol injection. Uh, if PCM levels are available, you plot it in the normogram. If the if above the treatment line, you continue NAC. Uh, if time of, inj of injection is not known, no more than 24 hours, give NAC if clinically uh, symptomatic. You need to check the LTA INR and continue NAC if the LTO INR is increased. And you can uh, discontinue the NAC treatment if ALTA and INR are normal. What are the problems with NAC? As I said earlier, there you can have anaphylactoid reactions, which are very common. The anaphylaxis is actually rare. Um, anaphylactoid re reactions, they occur in 10 to 50% of patients and uh, more likely to occur in patients with lower paracetamol ingestion because, you know, NAPQI appears to be protective because uh, the patient has taken low paracetamol levels and you have given uh, NAC, then uh, they uh, will be having anaphylactoid reactions most commonly nausea, vomiting, and flushing. So um, anaphylactic reaction is very rare, and there are reported cases of true anaphylactic reactions, and that do need to be uh, treated according to the conventional guidelines. So what are you going to do if a patient uh, develops anaphylactoid reaction to NAC? Uh, you need to stop the infusion. Uh, usually ha it happens with the first bag of NAC, as I said earlier. You treat with clopidogrel or promethazine, and then uh, the neck can be recommenced once the symptoms settle uh, at the half rate for 30 minutes and then uh, recommence as per normal protocol. That's how you recommence the neck. So when I'm going to stop neck, uh, if, if the patient is having um, ALT or AST decreasing, INR is less than two, patient clinically well, then if all these three things are met, then you can stop uh, an acetyl cysteine. Now, this is an indication for liver transplantation if one of the following criteria are met. If the patient is having an INR more than three or uh, 4.5 at any time, oliguria or creatinine more than 200 micromoles per liter, the persistent acidosis pH less than 7.3 or arterial lactate more than three, systolic hypertension with BP less than 80 millimeters of mercury despite resuscitation, hypoglycemia, trivia, severe thrombocytopenia or encephalopathy of any drink free or any alteration of consciousness not associated with sedative or injections. The patient might need, uh, you know, a liver transplantation. So you have to be really careful when you are managing these patients. A little bit about plant poisons. Uh, I will rush through this because of time constraints. Uh, now, which uh, try to identify the photograph, which one of the poisonous plant listed is shown in the photograph? Is it Kaneru, Tia Kaduru, Vada Kaduru, Alinda or Niyangala? The answer is, this is Tia Kaduru, okay? Uh, so, which one of the poisonous plant listed is shown in the photograph? I think all of you know this one, of course. Uh, it's Kaneru. Um, let us uh, try to identify some more poisonous plants. So, this is uh, Datura, what you call Athana. And uh, this is uh, Niangala, Gloriosa. And this is Vatendaru. And this is Behetendaru. Actually, all these things i'm not going to go into details today of these poisons because it's a separate subject itself um, i'll touch a little uh, on uh, kaneru poisoning uh, again uh, 
Khaneru, uh, you need to do a whole bowel irrigation, gastric lavage, or multiple doses of activated charcoal is indicated uh, for patients with Khaneru poisoning. Is, uh, you know, two seeds can be very detrimental uh, to the patient. Um, unfortunately, Blood pressure is normal, atropine is not needed unless the pulse rate falls less than 40 beats per minute, but we'll need continuous ECG monitoring in um, all these patients. Uh, hypokalemia should be corrected because the patients can have hypokalemia also due to excessive vomiting in cases of Kaneru poisoning, but you need to uh, uh, remember you shouldn't be giving calcium gluconate when you are giving insulin dextrose in case of hyperkalemia. For all the other patients, you usually give calcium gluconate, but not for Kaneru poisoning. It can result in stone heart and increase the dysrhythmia. So remember that uh, uh, very uh, you have to keep it in mind because you know you tend to give it. Uh, so in summary, uh, in a patient with uh, poisoning. First, do the ABCD assessment to stabilize the patient and try to come to a conclusion. Uh, and according to the available clinical symptom signs, uh, uh, collateral history, try to come to a diagnosis what, uh, the, what is the tentative poison the patient must have taken. And then if the antidote is available, use it before activated charcoal or gastric lavage according to the indications. Especially in the case of uh, OP poisoning, you have to give atropine first of all. Induction of emesis should not be done at any point of time. Uh, gastric lavage you consider in life-threatening ingestion, and if the patient presented less than two hours of in, uh, of ingestion, and um, in certain circumstances you might even you know consider four hours, as I said earlier, if large doses and slow release medications. After about four hours, you can continue. You can consider giving gastric lavage. Activated charcoal, again, only in selected patients because some of the substances might not be absorbed by the activated charcoal. For an instance, if the patient has taken ethylene glycol or methanol poisoning, uh, there's no point of giving activated charcoal. So you need to get your senior's opinion very early and get the help of them and try to manage this patient because you know, toxicology uh, patients who are coming with poisons, toxicological patients, actually they are uh, in their young uh, prime life. Uh, so they can, they can be uh, resuscitated very quickly with very uh, good supportive measures and uh, quick ABCD assessment. And if you attend to them quickly and give supportive management, you can uh, save their life. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, uh, Himal? Yes, thank you, madam. Thank you for the excellent uh, brief outline regarding the acute uh, poisoning management. We have a couple of, uh, we have actually a lot of questions coming through our chat line as well. Uh, so we'll start one by one, madam. Uh, so you, you answer these questions uh, at your lecture, but uh, I think these questions should be highlighted again and again because a lot of people are asking these. So, uh, regarding the post emesis, is there any place for plant poisoning particularly? Sorry? Uh, regarding the post emesis, post vomiting, yes. is there is a place in particularly in plant poisoning? Plant poisoning also there's a place, you know, in certain, uh, in some of the things anyway, the, the induction is uh, contraindicated now, but plant poisons, uh, we do, uh, you know, you mean induce, induction of vomiting? Induction of vomiting. No, 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 never. Induction of vomiting, never. So for any case, any poison, induction of vomiting, never. Uh, second question, madam, regarding the TCA poisoning, uh, should we need to give bicarbonate before the incubation? Uh, I think the 
audience, the person who's asking the question comes to the logic, is it that easy a poison? Is it that you have to give a bicarbonate before the interview? Uh, again, that will uh, that will depend on the clinical situation. As I said, you might have to consider giving bicarbonate if you know ECG is showing evidence of uh, you know uh, all the uh, toxicities. Uh, then you might have to give bicarbonate before intubating. Yes, agree. Uh, the third one, madam, uh, do we need to uh, do skin decompensation? Do we need to? Do the skin decontamination for every uh, not, not exactly. You know, don't waste any time. You know, for every patient, you don't need to do it. If you just remove the clothes and you know, just do a quick washing, it's sufficient. Because uh, if the patient has not spilled everything all over the body, it's not indicated. You will be losing so much of uh, important uh, time when you are trying to do. Uh, you know that. Uh, so don't try to decontaminate each and every patient, but uh, act accordingly. Uh, right, madam. Even though we have discussed this uh, topic uh, thoroughly, uh, a lot of questions are coming to this line. Atropine uh, in OP poisoning. How long usually we need to continue the atropine? How long usually? And the second one is how you differentiate the management uh, outline with OP and carb main poisoning. Now, as I said earlier, until you uh, uh, you reach that goal, you know, uh, the, your pulse rate should be uh, uh, more than 80, 80 to 100. You have to maintain in that range. The blood pressure is normal. The lungs are, uh, you know, dry. The axillaries are clear. And uh, the pupils is no longer constricted because the pupils will take some time to dilate. So until such time, you might have to, Give a tropin. There's no clear cut, you know, uh, uh, time frame that depends on the patient's clinical situation. And you might have to continue, as, as I said earlier, hundreds of, uh, you know, um, uh, milligrams of uh, atropine will be needed. Sometimes you might have to continue for even for five days if the patient is having, a, has taken a lipid soluble, you know, OP. So that has to be decided uh, with the clinical uh, condition of the patient. And uh, the next question you are. Ask this, uh, what's the difference? Uh, yeah, there you give atropine only and uh, uh, PAM is not given. So that's the only uh, difference. And the patients will not go, you not usually go into intermediate syndrome uh, with the carbamate, the same as, same as uh, OP. And uh, uh, next and the other thing, sorry, and the other thing is uh, carbamate uh, poisonings, they usually does not require that uh, huge doses of atropine. Uh, next question regarding again the same, like, OP poisoning. Uh, do we have to give PAM and atropine both in OP poisoning? Um, I think I have addressed that. Yeah. Because, you know, in certain certain studies have actually showed that uh, you can continue with atropine because we will be giving PAM for the uh, nicotinic effects um, for the, for, for to, you know, uh, if the patient is having so much of nicotinic effects, the PAM is also having a place. So uh, they usually ask to give atropine and PAM together, not PAM all by itself. I think I have answered the question earlier. We have discussed this one again, madam. We just asking about continuously asking question. I have highlighted this. So, uh, if a hallucination and agitation occurs while on atropine infusion, if the our parameters not achieved, do we have to discontinue or reduce the dose? Actually, uh, if the patient is agitated while watching in the patient, you need to. Uh, it's a fine balance, as I said. If if right. you are uh, if you are uh, targets are not achieved, you might have to give. If it is just a hallucination, because sometimes they can develop hallucinations, but most of the time patient has actually uh, developed uh, your target, reached your targets also. But don't rely on the, uh, the pupils, because it will take some time. Right. Uh, poisoning uh, like corrosive agents, like uh, pinks do we have to do a new activate charcoal? Poisoning like corrosive agents uh, like pink soap. Do we have to do the activate charcoal? 
uh, actually the my uh, my uh, experience with prinsa is very very minimum i have to uh, say that because you know uh, we rarely get any uh, patients with prinsa poisoning in uh, in teaching hospital peradine but i heard that there are lots of uh, prinsa poisonings in um, in uh, this area i mean uh, southern area southern area yeah southern area so uh, anyway this uh, because it's a corrosive agent we sh shouldn't be giving a lavages but uh, i think uh, um, you can consider giving charcoal i'm not 100% sure about that i need to uh, actually uh, you know go through the literature i'm not 100% sure about it uh, madam uh, there are a lot of uh... discrepancies on the cut off value when we start in the antidote for the pcm poisoning can you please highlight the values the toxic dose and the therapeutic dose because a lot of uh, audience in ours yeah yeah I, i i can understand that because you know toxic dose is 200 but we start treatment with 150 mg per kg body weight because it's it's uh, in the ideal situation you shouldn't be doing this ideal situation you do the uh, value for the same value after 4 hours all right and then you plot it and if it is more you start it but when you are in a resource poor setting like us you might have to go by you know lower um, uh, margin and then that is actually considered in uh, other countries also like in australia new zealand canada as i said previously rumac matthew nomogram shows that cut off as 150 uh, uh, but the toxic dose is with more than 200 all right so don't get that confused you start if it is more than 150 uh, madam i mentioned about uh, next solution infusion uh, two bag and three bag method our audience are asking whether which one is the better um as i said both both things are both methods are okay uh, with the first uh, one what happened was uh, there are lots of reaction that's why most of the countries they have stopped it as well as you know there's uh, the same dose is given you know in uh, in uh, two methods so there's no difference between the uh, dosages but it's the way how you give the effect is the same they have they have in the in the researches they have found the effect is the same so you can either use uh, three bag or two bag in our country there are less uh, number of anaphylactoid reactions actually because we also use a uh, three bag method in uh, peradenia we rarely get anaphylactoid reactions perhaps in other countries because there are more anaphylactoid reactions they have thought of you know starting this two bag method last question madam uh, oh no that if we found a compound patient come with the compound uh, we don't know I, we can't find the source uh, find the compound exactly what this is to so any anyone to contact in this particular situation uh, as i said if if you don't know uh, you know the the substance nobody can help you you know if you know the substance of course anybody can help you but then it has to be a clinical judgment again you need to go with the i think we i will discuss about a, uh, about toxidromes a little in in a in a later discussion i think uh, so once you we once we do that lecture i think you will be able to get a rough idea how to approach a patient with you know in such circumstances because you don't know anything but the patient's clinical condition may lead to a certain certain Uh, uh diagnosis all right that's how you actually come to a diagnosis because uh, you can't ask anybody you know you don't know the substance if you know the substance you can google it and always there's a book called you know uh, management of poison uh, by uh, professor ravindra fernando and get familiarized with the book because most of you all don't know how to actually refer it uh, it's it's very uh, i think the the newest edition is very good Uh, it's uh, use a friendly also so go through that book and know how to uh, how to uh, you know refer it and it's free of charge you can always you know get it from the poison center colombo not from us um, and then uh, if what we all do is also when you don't know something we google it you know and see and you there are certain uh, 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 tox bases 
toxicological information is in, uh, stored in bases, uh, you know, drives. So it, one such thing is tox base, which is actually uh, the, the one used in UK. And there's uh, uh, Wikitox also. Uh, tox base, uh, it's very cheap actually. You can uh, do a subscription. Annual subscription is about, you know, $6 or something, $6 or $7. Earlier, it's, it was very cheap. Now that the dollar has gone up a little, I think it's a bit, uh, it's a bit, uh, but it's an annual subscription. So actually, uh, for the PGs, it's, it's going to be really useful, tox base. So uh, purchase it and always you can refer whenever necessary. Uh, that will be all for the questions, madam. And I would like to thank you again regarding this wonderful lecture on poisoning and uh, how to manage in active setting. And we'll be expecting you in a future session as well as we say toxidome sessions. And uh, let me remind you all to uh, audience that this session is collaborative effect uh, session. Sri Lankan Medicine of Internal College. I have to thank Dr. Ganapathyanda and Dr. Nandini Nanaprakas for coordinating for us. And uh, last but the least, I have to thank all our audience uh, for connecting with us in this difficult situation. And uh, you will be seeing the link for your CPD certificate in the chat box. Please fill it and send to us. Uh, and you will be receiving the CPD certificate. So thank you very much, Madam, for joining with us. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much for inviting me also. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We'll be concluding session now.